Hello, everyone. I'm Eve Kahn. I'm a proud board member of the Victorian Society's New York chapter. I am so honored to serve on the board of a group that gets uh, amazing speakers like tonight's roster. A um, couple housekeeping items. You may have heard these before. Keep yourself on mute during the talks. Uh, put your questions into the chat as they come to you to ensure a lively intellectual dialogue. Afterwards, we're going to take all the questions at the end. We're going to let the three speakers run through their talks um, and make sure you sign up for our Eventbrite alerts because we have great events being planned for the, the next few months about every imaginable aspect of the Victorian world from uh, dinosaur discoveries to aviation. Um, and just briefly, tonight's speakers who are winners of our 2022 Emerging Scholars contest. Um, Hannah Morand is a graduate student at the University of Toronto. She will be shedding light on Brooklyn's little known Gettysburg Cyclorama. Um, Anna Lee, a graduate student in the University of Vienna, will explore Tin Pan Alley's othering of Chinese people and Chinese Americans. Um, and Madeline Porcella of the Bard Graduate Center will reveal the secrets. So we'll take questions at, after the three speakers go, as I said, and uh, I am so delighted that our contest drew young scholars like this to explore um, these very topics in such depth, um, all demonstrating how the Victorian era continues to yield discoveries and insights into our own time. So without further ado, Hannah, the Victorian Society Zoom stage is yours. She'll be followed by Anna and Madeline, Q&A, and thank you to everyone for coming. Thank you to the whole Victorian Society team for making this possible. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so I've been introduced. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so Brooklyn's Gettysburg Cyclorama, designing and dividing the spaces of commemoration, education, and recreation for the modern city dweller in the late 19th century. As the veterans from both sides of the American Civil War returned to civil life, they sought to commemorate or commiserate over their military past through the erection of monuments. Recent events have bolstered international attention in condemning the lost cause narrative that occasioned the elevation of statues, flags, and memorials by Confederate supporters. However, before the apogee of this particular view of the antebellum South, a variety of novels, textbooks, paintings, holidays, and the newer technologies of photography, postcards, strobo stroboscopic animation, stereoscopes, and, and photography were called upon to chronicle diverging accounts of the battles. One such mid-century effort to enhance the viewer's experience of past events was the cyclorama. Getting the slide to work here. Throughout Europe and North America, this popular attraction sets spectators atop a platform surrounded by a hyperbolic panoramic painting depicting religious view, religious and military epics, and often enhanced by either music, human scale dioramas, immersive elements such as smoke, disguised actors, or a key connecting the figures and places to a story. So here I have an example of that, which is the cyclorama of Saint-Anne de Beaupré in Quebec, which is standing but left to be abandoned and might collapse at any moment, very sadly. Um, and then here's some dioramas so we have the canvas in the background and then in the foreground, we see uh, some dioramic uh, figures. And then the one that we have on the left, uh, on the bottom left is from the Brooklyn Cyclorama. And there's actually half, a di uh, I'll return to that, but it's half a dumb um, uh, diorama and half on the canvas. Uh, so it, it goes 3D to 2D. Uh, Paul Philippe Toto was trained as most pan panoramas in academic, art at the Beaux-Arts in Paris. Commissioned in 1879 by a group of Chicago investors and veterans, the artist set about depicting the fast action and heavy losses occasioned by the Union victory against Pickett's Charge on the third day of the, Get the Battle of Gettysburg on July 3, 1863. With the financial backing of the Chicago-based American National Panorama Company, the artist traveled to the site of the conflict to collect photos, measurements, interviews, and sketches. Returning to his studios in Brussels, Philippe Otto and a team of artists started painting the 30 minute long military action on a 15 meter high by 120 meter canvas. His research was apparently sufficient to surmount his not having experienced the events as General John Gibbon, depicted on the Eastern side of the cyclorama commented, quote, I never before had an idea that the eye could be so deceived by paint and canvas. The perspective and representation of the landscape is simply perfect. 
it was difficult to disabuse my mind of the impression that I was actually on the ground. With this success, not only was Philippe Otto asked to produce a second piece for Chicago, he was, at, he was tasked with repeating his Gettysburg exploit in Boston, Philadelphia, and Brooklyn. It is with the arrival of the panorama opposite the imposing neoclassical structure of Brooklyn City Hall that I will concentrate this presentation. In considering the short lifespan of this, of this work of art and its building, I will attempt to present a sense of the rapid pace of change in the built environment of the metropole, but also in the process of modernizing and hierarchizing such con concepts as entertainment, education, and amusement. Looking at the cyclorama as a medium will lend impetus to a more expansive exploration of the histories of technology, urbanization, and segmentation, social stratification, and access to leisure. Whilst the subject of the, of the canvas, the, the Battle of Gettysburg, and those attracted to its unionist rendition will propel this research away from considering New York as, an except, as exceptional for its metropolitan life and into viewing its residents and urban relics as characteristic of the Northern Union states recuperating from a civil war. Adjusting to an overcrowded and insalubrious urban life was an arduous struggle for the lower classes and recent immigrants occupying dilapidated tenements in the shadow of New York's ever taller cityscape in the late 19th century. The unsanitary and cramped conditions combined to proliferate maladies and afflictions, including pneumonia, measles, scarlet fever, diphtheria, diarrheal diseases, malaria, and diseases of the nervous system, along with higher rates of alcoholism and suicide-related deaths. The 1881 census, from which this list of causes of deaths was collected, presented a mortality rate of 82 per thousand and an average life expectancy of just over 30 years at birth against a national mortality of, eight, of 18 and a life expectancy of 54. A situation aggravated by the 1873 collapse, it was only when the upper classes were directly affected by the ills of metropolitan life that urban planners were summoned to affect sizable adjustments to the urban landscape. Indeed, the 1849 cholera outbreak, insubordinate in, in, in its contamination to the hierarchies of, of the city's social order, meant that sewer, a sewer system was slowly installed. By the 1850s, and with an eye to urban transformation on the European continent, namely the cleanliness of Osmanian st streets in Paris, and Joseph Bazalgette's embankment parks and promenades in London, New York City sought to further improve the standards of living and sanitation for its population. Throughout the 19th century, parks, although mostly designed for the higher classes, became increasingly accessible to the working class as an escape from their cramped disease and pungent dwellings, as well as to better their moral condition. For instance, in London's Regent's Park, higher society could stroll amongst gardens, a zoo, and by the mid-century, two psychoramas. Patented by Robert Barker in 1787, the Full Circle Psychorama was exhibited in Edinburgh with sufficient success to prompt the fashioning of a second piece in Southwark District of London next to the then new Blackfriars Bridge. According to Sarah Hybrid's description of the 1827 Coliseum at Regent's Park, the panorama's work and the canvases' perception in the first half of the 19th century was comparable to that of popular stage productions. Like Regent's Park cycloramas associated with the Park City movement, the first panorama patented in the US by John Vanderlyn, panoramic view of the palace and garden of Versailles, 1818, was initially part of the artist Greek revival rotunda in Lower Manhattan's City Hall Park and is now on display at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Attracted to the cylinder cylindrical structures found in parks and vacant urban lots by such tantalizing advertisements as, quote, the most novel, weird, and magnificent exhibition ever conceived, end quote, the psychorama can be related to a history of recreation and schemes for urban improvement, but also to a mercantile tradition of amassing curiosities and immersing the public in a fabricated sense of institute access to collections. Although not quite a freak show, of which New Yorkers had a sizable selection, including the Playland Arcade, Hubert's Dime Museum in Times Square, and the traveling circus shows of Barnum and Bailey. The cyclorama embodied remnants of an early modern fascination for the foreign. In spite of Paul Philippe Otto's earlier work on the colonial holdings of France and North Africa, 
having been condemned for essentializing the Arabic world. The Brooklyn Cyclorama, due to its domestic subject, did little to exoticize its figures. It was, however, impacted by the same capitalistic trends influencing the genesis of public museology. Most visitors to the Cyclorama, unlike those entering a traditional art exhibit, were looking for a sensory experience that surpassed the two-dimensional capacities of point de suite and dramatic contrast in Beaux-Arts acad academicism. The, Vic the Victorian audience in entering the Cycloramas, popping up all over Europe and North America, engaged in the time's negotiation between fine arts, scientific precision, and theater, as well as the new media related to photography. In fact, central to this medium was an increased association between perception and nervous stimuli. Barker's 1787 patent had instated that the painter should, quote, delineate correctly and connectedly every object which, which presents itself to his view as he turns around. He must observe lights and shadows how they fall. <clears throat> Thus, the 360 degrees of the panorama, the hyperbolic shape and platform bringing the viewer closer to its intricate details, the light streaming in from openings to the sky or rudimentary lighting, systems against the obscurity of the wooden structure, the immersive curatorial ad additions of smoke, the music, the dioramas, and the pamphlets meant that the target audience was just as enticed by the educational subjects presented as by their capacities for a unique experience. The monitor of the Merrimack panorama, also exhibited in, in New York, boasted in its program that, quote, while the floor is covered with natural ground, water, grass, trees, and other accessories, so perfectly that the observer who stands in the center of it all cannot discern where the real joins the representation. So here's the, the Pickett's charge. In the case of Pickett's charge, this mo like most military scenes, the spectator could walk amongst cannons, trees, and mannequins, including a wounded body splayed out onto a stretcher with one end being carried by a two-dimensional figure and held on the other side by a three-dimensional dummy, giving a fleeting impression of having at least in part witnessed the chaos of military action. If one is to consider cyclorama as a sort of time machine, one should remember that the first visitors to have stepped into the Brooklyn cyclorama were traveling a mere 20 years back and possibly only into their own memory. By November, 1888, the space was closed on account of, quote, the reception which has been tendered by manager J.M. Hill to the veterans of the blue and gray, end quote. The contemporane contemporaneity of the work with its visitors has already been attested to by General Jim Gibbons praising the verisimilitude of the painting. Indeed, whilst describing the arrival of the cyclorama in Brooklyn, the Scientific American, a popular magazine reporting on new patents and prototypes, mentions the combatants on the, ca on the canvas, along with the, off the offices they occupied at the time of the article's pu publication in 1886. Again in 1889, quote, an old soldier imagine, uh, admired the painting as though he had never seen it. And in 1891, the psycho mama was entertaining a phonograph exhibit, which, quote, attracts a good deal of attention. And there are interesting war lectures by Lieutenant Colonel Slocum, end quote. Along with the aforementioned monitor of the Merrimack panorama, the Gettysburg was one of three historical psychoramas depicting the Civil War, all of which have or are suspected of having several copies and counterfeits. Although they all depict Confederate defeats, the last of these, the Battle of Atlanta psychorama, has been used as a shrine for groups wishing to commemorate and celebrate highly revised and idealized accounts of the antebellum South and the resistance of the Confederacy against the so-called Northern aggression. In an age of marvel towards scientific achievement and frenzy over profits generated by new forms of entertainment, the Scientific American informed its readers of the cyclorama being set up in Brooklyn. It described the medium as having grown out of an Italian tradition of panoramic painting and into, quote, a matter of special calculation, which is celebrated for its elusive effect. Adding, quote, irrespective of its artistic merits, which are very great, the technical details of its construction and the solution in it by means of photography of the problems of cylindrical perspective alluded to above possess much interest. With continued awe over the, its mechanics, the author of the article reveled in the sophistication of the engineering design, holding up the chassis and hyperbola 
of the canvas, placing the spectator before a near th three-dimensional work, as well as the capacity of modern ships to transport the immense, uh, the immense piece from Belgium. Only to commend Philippe Otto on his methodical use of interviews with eyewitnesses and photography was the subject of the piece mentioned. And then again, it was done so only to explain how photographing, photographing the field at Gettysburg was mathematically justified. We have a little um, rendition of that. Um, in sum, concern over scientific objectivity of photography outweighed interest over the intricacies of Beaux Arts techniques used by the artists. Only a year after its Brooklyn arrival, the cyclorama was sold by one T.M. Hill, who relocated the canvas and its structure to the corner of Fourth Avenue, now Park Avenue South, and 19th Street in Gramercy Park. Although in 1889, the cyclorama was said by the Evening World to quote, still enjoy considerable, considerable patronage. By 1897, the canvas had been sold to join a traveling show and a certain Mr. Waz was negotiating for the, purpose, for the purchase of the old cyclorama building. Unless Waz meant for its destruction, the deal must have fallen through as a 1900 map of Manhattan's built environment no longer showed its distinct circular form. With dwindling revenues, as was the case of most cycloramas, three of the four original Filippotto copies were sold to travel from city to city. The whereabouts of these confused amongst numerous forgeries, wherein there are more cycloramas claiming to be authentic than four, is the subject of fierce debate. In any case, the Brooklyn cycloramas, um, initial, uh, uh, the Brooklyn cycloramas initial attraction as a leisurely escape from a cramped city life or as plunging the New York City dweller into a cutting edge of science. Its numerous forgeries and its eventual sale due to waning popularity all place the medium into a chronology of technology for mass entertainment. A few streets north of the Gramercy Cyclorama on Madison Avenue and 59th Street, Louis Le Prince was working on the installation for the Monitor and Mer Merrimack panorama, possibly inspired by his encounters with Jean-Aimé Leroy, who used his eponymous projectors to supplement the work of painters with photography at the panorama and personally motivated by adding movement to the static action scenes he witnessed daily. The recent French émigré created a method for adding motion picture. Tangentially, tangentially one might note that Louis Daguerre, a few decades earlier, had imagined the daguerreotype alongside his dioramas, his diorama theaters. Regardless of his technological influence, Louis Le Prince is now credited by many as the father of cinemata cinematography for his 1888 Round Hay garden scene. No longer restrained by these titanic and costly canvases, it is with no surprise that the development of motion pictures signaled the end of the craze of cycloramas. In fact, by the 1880s, the excitement had already been dwindling. The temporary reprieve afforded by the scale and precision of Philippe Poteau's work shows us that however fast moving the history of film, the near century long enthusiasm for this panoramic genre did not simply die out in the, 19, the 1890s. For instance, as cyclorama buildings were converted into circuses, skating rinks, and a velocipedique, the Chase Electric Cyclorama thought to rejuvenate the genre by using a combination of photography projection and the kinetoscope to offer a circular moving image. I think I included this in the last slide, it's on the bottom right. Interestingly, although, although cinema has since asserted itself as a hegemonic medium dominating the entertainment industry, cycloramas were frequent in world fairs throughout the 20th century and are still being created today. As of 2014, there were 64 pa panoramic paintings left of an estimated near thousand in the, early in the early 20th century. However, 28 of these were completed after 1992 to cater to a momentary Southeast Asian fondness for the 360 degree experience. And only, only 16 cycloramas in vastly varying states of conservation predate 1914. The only certified surviving Gettysburg cyclorama was relocated in 1912 to the National Military Park and restored from 2005 and 2008, where we can still visit it now. Like the Brooklyn Cyclorama, the Chicago version was initially commissioned by war veterans and entrepreneurs, including Marshall Field, owner of the eponymous
class-based divisions exemplified by attendance at the Brooklyn Cyclorama echo the chronology of panoramas worldwide. In sum, from its pedest pedestal as art for high, for high society, battlefield-themed cycloramas attracted an increasingly diverse, diverse crowd, which in the case of the Civil War ones, manifested in forms of commemoration aligned with the location of the exhibit rather than the side that had commissioned the original piece. The Brooklyn Cyclorama, if contemplated as the space for evasion, inscribes itself into the history of New York as a witness to events symptomatic of Victorian metropolitan life. When considering its subject, it relates this same structure and New York City by extension to history more widely shared amongst Americans in the post-war. Thank you. Here's my bibliography, but oh. <laughs> yeah, oh. if anybody needs that. Okay, we'll put that. All right, we'll feel we'll, we'll put your email in the chat, and people can ask for that. Okay. Oh my gosh, Hannah, that's absolutely fascinating. And now I'm realizing, oh, I'm making all these connections because we could look at this horrific civil war scene and feel slightly better about the terrible tenements that occur. Go else like, oh well, the North is okay, even though right because we triumphed, even though we've got such immigrant chaos going on at our feet. Oh my God, absolutely fascinating. Um, Anna, where is Anna? Anna, please take the stage. Thank you, Anna. Thank you so much. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Okay, wait. Um, is that visible? Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, so first of all, thank you for the possibility to present this project today, which is hopefully going to be my um, completed master's thesis at the end of this year. <laughs> yeah, let's dive right in. Um, David A. Jason starts his book, Tin Pan Alley, with the remark that, quote, the history of Tin Pan Alley is the history of the United States as seen by its tunesmiths, end quote. This seems to be quite true, considering the various parallels that can be found between the sheet music business and society in the US around the turn of the 20th century. The songs that came out of Tin Pan Alley are valuable contemporary witnesses of the turn of the 20th century in the United States. Before I dive deeper into um, the topic of my project, I'd like to give a quick overview of the points I'll discuss today. Um, first, I want to give a very short overview of a Tin Pan Alley as a phenomenon, just quickly explaining what it is and talking about the structures and mechanisms that we're looking at. Secondly, I want to talk about um, some definitions and terms that I need to look closer at in this context, such as othering, orientalism, exoticism, and cultural appropriation. And then I will talk about the main subject of this project, which is um, the notions of othering of Chinese and Chinese Americans in Tin Pan Alley songs, giving some historical context. And in the end, I would like to give a short summary and outline some further questions to, to be asked in this context. So chapter one, Tin Pan Alley. The term Tin Pan Alley started out as a nickname, apparently first given by columnist Monroe Rosenfeld in 1903 for West 28th Street between Broadway and Sixth Avenue in New York City, hinting at the tinny sound the many songwriters' pianos emanated through the windows of their studios. However, soon it referred to any form of popular sheet music business, regardless of its geographical origin. About half of the 10 major publishers never even worked on West 28th Street, and half did, however, briefly. While becoming wildly popular between 1890 and 1950, Tin Pan Alley was also seen as a generic term for mass culture and often understood negatively, especially before the rise of Hollywood. What defines Tin Pan Alley is that, quote, Oh, sorry, <laughs> is that quote, the consumer becomes a performer rather than simply a listener, end quote, which is why the death of Tin Pan Alley is often parallelized with the rise of technology and media such as TV, records and films in the 1950s. There is not one specific musical form that Tin Pan Alley songs follow. Instead, popular music evolved in very many different ways between 1890 and 1950, reaching from Broadway show tunes to tear jerkers, but all marketed for grown-ups. However, typically Tin Pan Alley songs did consist of 32 bars. A good phrase of eight bars used to start the refrain is repeated twice more with a new eight bar added, which is much less important as George Gershwin described it. The way these songs were made profitable was through the marketing of sheet music. 
This business soon blossomed, considering that for the most part of the 19th century, popular music had not been institutionalized in any way, and publishers of popular music were little to non-existent. My project looks at the time frame of 1893 to 1920, as the former marks the year that um, M. Whitmark and Sons, the famous publishers, stationed their business at 49 West 28th Street, and the latter classifies a new era in music for various different reasons, reaching from the end of World War I to rising influences in jazz and blues, the technical developments in music such as radio and records, and on a societal level in the United States, prohibition. Musically and lyrically, Tin Pan Alley songs had to be memorable and harmony as well as melody easy to learn, especially as the sheet music trade grew and playing Tin Pan Alley songs was the norm for middle class families in the US. The term Moon June Spoon songs was soon coined, describing the oftentimes fairly superficial lyrics of these popular songs. This cliche originated from the verse lyrics of the song By the Light of the Silvery Moon by Gus Edwards and Edward Madden in 1909. However, Ali songs did comment on many different, different significant social processes, ranging from simple trends to even political conflicts the US were a part of. And that brings me to my next chapter. Um, just some quick terms and definitions. So starting with othering, the base of othering is recognizing that there is an other, which simultaneously means recognizing the self. In order to be able to talk about a group as other or self, there have to exist real or imagined characteristics which are assigned to these specific groups. Belonging to a group then depends on the chosen characteristics which define the membership. Mike Krang differentiates two kinds of characteristics, elective and descriptive, the former describing those which can be chosen individually and the latter being generally given traits. The matter then becomes problematic when the other is positioned as inferior to the self which is a fundamental pattern of exoticism and orientalism, even if the other is often portrayed in a very romanticizing way on the surface. The assignment of characteristics to the other by the self is destined to become a game of power, oppression, and even domination. And especially concerning groups whose history is influenced by imperialism, colonialism, even globalization, forms of othering in exoticism and orientalism have to be viewed critically. Edward Said remarks in his study, Orientalism, Orientalism is better grasped as a set of constraints upon and limitations of thought than it is simply as a positive doctrine. In the essence of if the essence of Orientalism is the ineradicable distinction between Western superiority and Oriental inferiority, then we must be prepared to note how in its development and subsequent history, Orientalism deepened and even hardened the distinction. What is important when speaking about these concepts is to also distinguish between cultural appreciation and cultural appropriation. The problem of cultural appropriation is not the act of portraying a certain culture, it is the strategy of doing so. By trivializing or overlooking certain aspects of a culture, or even just a group identifying with said culture, this can not be only disrespectful, but also harmful to the members of the community, leading to prejudice, discrimination and racism. I think that it is very important to recognize the stereotypical and racially blurred aspects in dealing with these Tin Pan Alley songs. However, it would of course not serve the motion of this study to only interpret the songs to that effect, since in the time frame we are looking at this debate was non-existent. Chapter three, notions of othering of Chinese on Tin Pan Alley. I want to begin this chapter by outlining a very short historical context. Since the 1870s, the number of Chinese immigrants in the United States had increased greatly, and the governments had tried to exclude the Chinese from society through different ordinances. With the Federal Exclusion Act in 1882, Chinese laborers were officially not allowed into the U.S., and until 1924, until in 1924, all Chinese immigrants were prohibit prohibited from entering the country. Yet, though these concerns of immigration on the side of the United States and the social Darwinist visions of a society demarcated along racial and ethnic lines led to exclusion and racism against Chinese and Chinese Americans, the agents of popular culture still managed to make China and Orient-centered songs a huge trend in this time. Othering, and especially Orientalism, in Tin Pan Alley songs does not imply the Orientals to actually live in the Orient, as the large collection of songs about Chinatowns prove. 
This proves that othering does not need to happen on a large geographical scale. In fact, the closer communities live together, the easier it becomes to, to define these borders between self and other. Concerning Orientalism and the portrayal of China and Japan, in particular Tin Pan Ali songs, Michael Saffel distinguishes four main subjects. Ethnic stereotypes, exotic locations, including Chinatowns, romance in terms of travel, as well as sexual desire, and certain musical issues, including dancing, oriental instruments, and jazz. In the songs that I have analyzed so far, these four subjects can indeed be found as the most predominant. An important aspect concerning Orientalism and sheet music at the time are the vast stereotypical generalizations that happen. And these are visible in all three components of the songs, cover, lyric, and music. That being said, I would like to further explain um, some examples of othering in all three of these components, beginning with the cover art. The illustrations on the covers of sheet music were an extremely important factor since it was the first thing people would see in the shop and it had to inspire to impulsively buy many, many songs. It is especially noticeable that there is hardly ever a distinction made between Japan and China on these um, covers. Although lyrically concerning China, many songs had women in kimonos, which is traditional Japanese clothing, Japanese hairstyles, or even Japanese Tori gates or Mount Fuji depicted on the cover. This example, a song called The Wedding of the Chinese and the Kun, depicts an African-American groom with highly exaggerated thick lips and the Chinese bride in traditional Japanese uh, clothing and hairstyle at the ceremony. Lyrically, the idea that both cultures are barbaric is definitely pervade and a certain freakishness of this cultural mix is made very clear. This second example can be categorized again as an act of othering, but this time concerning Chinese women in particular. Judy Tsao's article on gendering race in this context shines light on the fact that most Chinese women in the US were seen as quote unquote loose women. This was already the case until the 1920s, but was intensified when from 1924 to 1930, no Chinese women were legally admitted to the US, while Chinese women and men for that matter, who were already in the US were more and more outcasted and forced to live in their own communities and Chinatowns respectively. Thus, many Chinese men visited brothels and so the image of the Chinese woman as prostitute and opium dealer was created and solidified. Pure were only the Chinese women who stayed in China, according to Tin Pan Ali songs. Although this picture that we see here might not seem like it today, the woman depicted on this cover, the exotic and erotic China doll, is clearly meant to be a prostitute with her inviting pose and dreamy eyes, as well as the open collar of her dress. Lyrics. Of course, in the lyrics, these stereotypes are just as obvious, if not even more obvious. It is interesting to see that Chinese as well as Japanese themed songs were depicted in one of two ways, either containing positive or negative ethnic prejudice. For the purpose of time, I'm using the single example of Chong, he come from Hong Kong from 1918, where of course we can also again criticize the racial stereotyping on the cover art, depicting Chong with a pigtail and lacking any traits of the stereotypical Western or white man. To describe Chinese man as not masculine, according to Western standards, and as children respectively, was very common, even in love songs, since Chinese men were never supposed to be attractive to American women anyway. The lyrics are as follows. Chinese man play all day on a drum. Chong no likey that song where Chinese man cry way up high, etc. Not only are the lyrics written to imitate the Chinese accent, the phrase Chinese man cry way up high refers to the Peking operas, where the singers learn a special falsetto technique, which has been done so for many, many centuries. On the one hand, the lyrics are therefore condescending on a special, uh, specific cultural phenomenon from China. And on the other hand, the phenomenon is taken out of context and used in order to demasculinize Chong, the protagonist of the song. Reminding ourselves of the definition of cultural appropriation as taking some cultural elements without understanding the subtleties and complexities of the phenomenon, this act fits perfectly into the idea. Music. Moving on to Orientalist as.
um, from okay, <laughs> um, is the song The Vamp from 1919, which was marketed as novelty oriental foxtrot on the cover. Despite the word vamp being again frequently used for Chinese women and or prostitutes, the rhythmic pattern of the song is typical for many oriental songs at the time, which I will play quickly to make it clear. More or less the exact same rhythmic pattern can also be found in this song, Hindustan, from 1918, which moves the spectrum from exclusively China and Japan to India. I'll play this example where you can hear the similarity from after this short introduction. Trappings jingle, harp strings sweetly tingle with the sweet voice. Staying with the song Hindustan and the melody we just heard from the voice, um, we can see a melody that is interesting for a number of reasons and shall be highlighted. This sequence here, with the, which is G, A flat, C, A flat, G, um, though not being pentatonic, rather in C minor, shows very a very large similarity to a sequence found in numerous Asian themed Tinpan Alley songs. To make the sequence pentatonic, the A flat would have to become an A, making it G A C A G, which is the exact melody of the song Chinatown, My Chinatown. This succession was extremely popular. In the song in Blinky Winky Chinky Chinatown, we find the exact same sequence in a different key. While pentatonicism is often used in popular culture, as well as also classical music to portray or imitate Asian and especially South and East Asian countries, I once more want to point out the vast generalizations, generalizations that are made throughout all these songs also in the music. The usage of pentatonic scales varies widely in each Asian tradition and each ethnic group. Japanese, Chinese, and Javanese systems, for example, while of course revealing similarities, are distinguishable, not only through the scales themselves, but through the use of certain tones within the scales. And for the Chinese system, the very term pentatonic has been questioned, although all the while having the most stereotypical association of pentatonicism in the Western world. What becomes clear through this in-depth view of East Asian imageries in early Timpan Alley songs is the recurring generalization of various places and cultures that come into place in cover, music, and lyrics. Additionally, stereotypes of Chinese men and women work to create an oriental other in these songs. The same can be said about musical compositions, which utilize popular pseudo-oriental elements such as pentatonic scales, many of which can still be found in Western popular cultures today. Though the topic has been discussed in the past, there is still a lot more to enlarge upon, not only to further exemplify the critical aspects talked about here, but also to talk to ask more questions about maybe cultural appropriation and appreciation, as well as viewing the topic from the Chinese side and deepening the knowledge of identity construction of first and second generation Chinese Americans in the first decades of the 20th century. However, even this short insight can open up many different aspects of othering that I hope my research will shine more light on during the next couple of months. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Anna. It was eerie and powerful and full of contemporary resonances about how we depict others and how we react to others in, in broad brush, unfortunate ways. Absolutely fascinating. And now we're going to hear for something completely different about an electric gown. Thank you, Madeline. Welcome to the Victorian Society Zoom yeah. stage. Thank you so much. Let me share my... Um, you can see that? Okay. Um, thanks so much for having me, everyone. I'm really excited to share this uh, research with you guys. So, 
Uh, here we go. Two weeks ago, actress Blake Lively arrived at the Met Gala Costume Institute themed gilded glamour in a show stopping Versace gown that transformed on the red carpet from bright metallic copper to teal, gaining agent patina before our very eyes. Lively's tribute to one of the most glamorous women of New York's Gilded Age, Lady Liberty herself, followed in the footsteps of a guest at another costume ball, Alva Vanderbilt's legendary fancy dress ball held in the spring of 1883. The electric light or spirit of electricity dress, which was designed by the House of Worth and is currently in the collection of the Museum of the City of New York, was socialite Alice Vanderbilt's tribute to the as yet uninstalled Statue of Liberty. Like Lively's gown, the dress was accessorized with a novel gimmick, an electric tor torch powered by a battery hidden within the gown. The costume initially drew my attention because it was so unique. Fancy dress costumes of the time tended towards the historical, ethnic, or natural. By contrast, Vanderbilt's costume referenced a recent technological innovation. Thomas Edison, whose experiments were funded in part by members of the Vanderbilt family, had made the first public demonstration of his um, incandescent light bulb to a crowd of 3,000 people only a few years earlier on New Year's Eve of 1879. A feat he repeated at the 1881 Exposition Internationale d'Electricité in Paris. Accounts in contemporary fashion magazines highlight the opulence and novelty of Vanderbilt's costume. The ball's guests were photographed by Jose Maria Mora. Um, and in the, in the Mora photograph on the right, you can see Alice Vanderbilt in costume holding an electric torch aloft, adopting the posture of the Statue of Liberty. This also caught my attention when I was initially um, beginning my research in part because the Statue of Liberty wasn't installed until 1886, and in part because I was curious, when I first saw the dress, I had a natural understanding of um, the, that electric light would be represented by this classicized female figure, but I wasn't sure exactly what the origins of that connection were, and I wanted to look into it further. Um, guided by the work of dress historian Rebecca Mitchell, I began to view the electric light dress as an exercise in self-fashioning. Mitchell argues that fancy dress costumes allowed women to render elite cultural contexts in personal terms. As I learned to read the language of Vanderbilt's costume, a message became legible. Vanderbilt was aligning herself with the future, literally donning cultural associations with electric light, which was a cutting edge technology, a fashionable novelty, a luxury commodity, and because of its association with the Statue of Liberty, a symbol of enlightenment ideals and modernity. Opulent costume was only one facet of the ball's larger function. The Vanderbilts, though unbelievably wealthy, had previously been excluded from the upper echelons of New York's Gilded Age social hierarchy because they were considered nouveau riche by older and more established families, particularly the Mrs. Astor, the gatekeeper of New York society in the period. The ball hosted by Mr. and Mrs. W.K. Vanderbilt at their recently completed Fifth Avenue mansion was designed to flip the balance of power via a display of wealth so ostentatious that not even Mrs. Astor could deny their position. In the theory of the leisure class published in 1899, Thorsten Devlin states that the utility of balls and other costly entertainments was to create an exchange of wealth and manners that assert a patriarch's power amongst his peers. He could easily have had the Vanderbilt ball in mind when he wrote these words. The party is estimated to have cost $250,000, which translates to roughly $6 million in today's currency. This figure includes flowers and decor. The house was completely transformed into a magnificent stage set for the night's reveries, which included dancing and a catered dinner from Delmonico's. And you can see in this image from um, Frank Leslie's illustrated newspaper, some of the floral arrangements in the background that were really ornate. Um, a contemporary article in Godey's Lady Book estimated that the one item of champagne alone cost $2,000. Devlin claims women's fashions as another site for the conspicuous display of wealth and manners. This is especially true of Vanderbilt's fancy dress, which despite being made from expensive materials by a renowned couturier, was presumably only worn once. The costume's quality would have been comparable with any couture of the time, and that level of quality was accompanied with a hefty price tag. Um, fancy ball costumes cost between $100 and $500, which again is roughly like, I think, $3,000 to $15,000 in today's currency. Um, the dress would certainly have been at the upper end of that range. You can see here in this interior photo, 
how carefully constructed the bodice is and also the, it's silk lined. And then you can also see some of the um, materials that were used were very expensive. So no expense was spared just because it was gonna be worn to a costume party. Um, the costume is made up of a white satin bodice, a gold satin overskirt and a midnight blue velvet underskirt. The bodice is cut with a decollete revealing neckline. The front of the overskirt is swagged and gathered, evoking classical drapery. Um, and I'll return to that point when I discuss the association Vanderbilt is making between herself and the Statue of Liberty. The skirt's back is open, revealing a richly embroidered underskirt and train. A peplum brings some volume to the hips, but in keeping with the trends of the day, the bulk of the skirt's volume is concentrated in the shelf-like bustle at the wearer's lower back. It's important to note um, that bustle points to this, that the dress wasn't, wasn't simply a costume, it was also extremely fashionable um, and would have alerted everyone at the party to Vanderbilt's knowledge of current trends. The costume achieves its electrifying effect via a resplendent design program featuring embroidery of gold and silver filament and beadwork done with clear and gold beads. The designs radiate outwards in graphic lightning bolt and starburst motifs and tinsel was applied playfully on the shoulders and bustle, affecting the illusion that sparks were flying off the young heiress. Beaded fringe on the under and over skirts achieves a similar effect. Even within the context of the ball's showy display of wealth, Vanderbilt's dress stood out for its opulence, its fashionable silhouette, and for the modernity of her chosen theme, electric light. In contrast, Alice Vanderbilt's husband, Cornelius Vanderbilt II, attended the ball as the French monarch Louis XVI, as did Mr. Edward Luke Meyer, Mr. Harriman, Mr. G.F. Fearing, Mr. Edward Spencer, and at least a dozen others which is to say it was an extremely popular choice that night. These popular historicizing costumes often incorporated pastiche historical references into anachronistic garments that were in keeping with the fashionable tastes of the day. Unlike masquerade balls of the 18th century, which participated in the mode of the carnivalesque, subverting social roles for masqueraders to realize desires otherwise forbidden by the social structures and sexual norms of polite society, Victorian fancy dress balls offered attendees the chance to represent their own personas, validating rather than subverting the social present. Historicizing costumes were popular because they created a link between the wearer and European aristocracy, asserting social power and position. Um, this Puck cartoon, which is mocking the Vanderbilt ball, um, mocks the aspirational self-fashioning that took place at American fancy dress balls. The caption reads, Mrs. Nack, Mrs. Knickerbocker gives a fancy dress ball following the practice of English nobility requests her guests to appear in the costumes worn by their ancestors 100 years ago. And as you can see, um, all of the people pictured are either in ethnic dress implying that they're immigrants or um, wearing colonial dresses of the lower classes implying that they've r risen the ranks of society only recently. Um, and all of this is a jab at the pretension American revelers generally exhibited in their aristocratic fancy dress. When choosing a costume, many partygoers relied on manuals like Arden Holt's Fancy Dresses Described or What to Wear at Fancy Dress Balls, which catalog costume ideas and detailed their component parts. At least three costumes at the Vanderbilt Ball seem to have been taken from Holt's Guide, which went through six illustrated editions between 1879 and 1896. Most of the costumes Holt describes are ethnic, historicizing, evocative of classical mythology, or inspired by the natural world. For example, Holt lists three kinds of bee, regular, queen, and busy. Um, and here you can see an illustration from Holt's manual, translate, how it translated into a costume that was worn at the Vanderbilt Ball. So she has lowered the neckline to make it slightly more fashionable and added what looks like a bustle, but um, it's pretty close to the book. Um, only two costumes in the edition that I was able to look at shared a kindred spirit with Vanderbilt's electric light dress, referencing recent technological innovations or feats of engineering, and they were the Suez Canal and the Telegraph. The relative rarity of suggestions that celebrated innovation showed just how brazen Vanderbilt was when choosing a costume to represent her persona. Rather than linking herself to long-established social structures, a value that perhaps carried more weight for the so-called old families, Vanderbilt reclaimed the derogatory designation of nouveau riche. 
flaunting her wealth in an elaborate costume that celebrated novelty. She, she thus linked herself and her family, not with the established past, but with the bright future. Holt's book also mentions the fashionable inclusion of electric light worn in the hair in such dresses as Morning and Evening Star, Will o' the Wisp, and there's also a glowworm costume, which is made up of an e evening dress of light brown satin or tulle with an electric star in the hair. Unfortunately, there was not an illustration of that one. I would have loved to see it. Um, any of those suggestions may have inspired the electric torch that Vanderbilt carried. The vogue for electric accessories wasn't limited to costumes. Both France, where Worth designed the dress, and the US, where Vanderbilt wore it, were swept up in a wave of electromania in the late 19th century. At the 1867 Exposition, Exposition Universelle in Paris, a French ele electrician named Gustave Trouvet exhibited electric jewelry designed for daily wear. Here I'm showing a Trouvet stick pin manufactured by a Auguste Germain cadet card that is currently in the collection of the Victoria and Albert Museum. Um, it would have been powered by a small battery concealed in the wearer's breast pocket. And when it was functional, the jaw would snap and the eyes would roll around in the head. Um, and Trouvet went on to design electric costumes that lit up for um, the Folie Bergère and think Louis Fuller, but I'm not, I'm, I'm going to pull that one back. I'm not hundred percent sure on that. Um, Swan and Edison began marketing domestic electricity in 1880. However, at the time, the new technology was prohibitively expensive, accessible only to the wealthiest members of society. Um, so aristocracy and titans of industry like Vanderbilt. Um, as it became more accessible, electric light was marketed to middle-class housewives and in instructive manuals like Alice Gordon's Domesticating Electricity as part of the constellation of luxury goods that made up the aspirational middle-class interior. This marketing successfully branded electricity as a desirable commodity, contributing to its appeal as a fashionable accessory. In addition to marketing electricity as a luxury good, early advertisements for electricity re represented visually as electric light, created an association between the new technology and enlightenment ideals regarding modernity, as well as Republican ideals regarding personal freedom or liberty. The graphic vernacular that emerged from these advertisements in both France and the US relied on neoclassical depictions of liberty um, in the zeitgeist of late 1870s and 1880s Paris and New York, a 151 foot tall copper colossus, Frederick Auguste Bartholdi's Statue of Liberty or Liberty Enlightening, Enlightening the World was a ready stand in for both electrical lighting and its concomitant associations with enlightenment and personal freedom. Shelley Cordulac has written about the graphic imagery, especially posters and magazines that emerged in the mid 1880s to demonstrate the development of a visual language of electricity and in particular, graphic designers appropriation of the Statue of Liberty as a stand-in for electricity itself. Bartholdi in turn appropriated images of La Liberté, the personification of the enlightenment ideals that drove the French Revolution. By the mid to late 19th century, this type of female figure thrusting forward, carrying a symbolic instrument, um, in the case of the Statue of Liberty, her torch, uh, and draped in classical costume was a trope of academic art. This is the pose that Vanderbilt adopts in the Mora portrait, her torch and the reference to classical drapery on her dress completing her transformation. Though the statue wasn't unveiled until 1886, it was displayed in parts throughout the 1870s as part of a fundraising campaign for the completion of the statue's pedestal. In 1876, Liberty's torch was displayed at the Centennial in Philadelphia illuminated with electric light. Her torch bearing arm was installed in Madison Square Park the following year. In addition to the torch held aloft enlightening the world, Bartholdi included further light imagery in the statue. The seven canonical rays that emanate from the statue's head, her crown, um, symbolize the sun's radiance to the seven planets, just as liberty enlightens the seven continents and the seven seas. In conclusion, uh, Vanderbilt's electric light dress rendered many facets of her surrounding culture in personal terms, allowing her to literally embody cultural shifts. 
By selecting the theme of electric light and the posture of the Statue of Liberty, Vanderbilt demonstrated her knowledge of current trends from Electromania to the Bartholdi statue fundraising efforts, as well as her alignment with the progressive values that they symbolized. These sartorial signifiers would have been legible in their original context. Party guests would have had some degree of fluency in their surrounding culture. As such, Vanderbilt projected the message to her peers that she was fashionable, modern, and progressive. In light of the party's motive to install the Vanderbilts comfortably at the top of New York society, Alice Vanderbilt's electric light dress can be read as somewhat tongue in cheek. While members of more established families came in historical costumes that can confirmed their status by linking them to European aristocracy and history, Vanderbilt made herself a vision of progress, perhaps a reference to her family's involvement in Edison's electric light company or a private joke about the designation of her wealth as too new. Either way, Vanderbilt's costume asserted that she and by extension her family were the future of New York society. Thank you. A stop share. That was amazing. All three of these, my brain is on fire because there's so many synergies between them about this deeply flawed American experience, right? Who are we and what kinds of shows we go to and we party and what do we listen to and what do we think that makes us, right? And all the, the anxiety of the flood of immigrants and how do we cope with that? And how do we maneuver in the world? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna write a dissertation just based on the synergies among these three talks. Absolutely riveting. Um, uh, do you have questions for each other? Cause I have a whole bunch of questions piled up and, and there's questions coming in from the chat. Um, my question, I'll get it started. My question for Hannah is how did you pick, how did you get interested? in that one of, one of many little round buildings in which we um, try to escape in some bizarre way into the past or the future. Yeah, um, I, so the one, the one year, I, I lived in Quebec City, um, I, did, I finished my high school there and um, my mom got invested in that uh, project because she works on ancient history and there's a good depiction of um, ancient his, uh, a biblical scene basically. And um, the, anyways, a long story, but basically nobody's paying attention to it because the city where, the town where it's in has sort of been deserted as a, as a religious uh, pilgrimage site since the sixties. And it used to be quite a major place, but um, so, so sort of efforts at um, recognizing that it's one of the last cycloramas uh, and it's this beautiful piece in, you know, in North America that doesn't actually have that many, uh, Beaux Arts canvases, uh, at least in, Quebec, in the Quebec. So uh, I, I sort of got interested through that, um, and then uh, I got um, I did some research on the the London one, and I, I study a lot of architecture, ar architectural history, and uh, been look ha have been looking at uh, landscapes, uh, cityscapes within Pan Cycloramas, basically. So I've seen that one in Quebec. It's right yeah. off the road. Yes, and it's a mess, and it's in a church. It's it's a mess, right? It's, yeah. and there's even a museum of of the cyclorama right there, and it's all a mess. And there were, yeah, there were ghosts all along that road. Oh, I've seen that one. It's absolutely it's a, yeah. Now it's close to the sub public, and I went to take pictures. Yeah. I it's uh, I underneath it's collapsing. Yeah, so it's actually being held on by by beer cans right now. But um, okay. it's the current state of it, which is quite tragic. Oh but. my God, a cyclorama held up by beer cans. A religion <laughs> that just doesn't get any better than this. Um, Anna, I am wondering if, um, so I know that black composers and Jewish composers wrote songs making fun of themselves and pretending to be somebody that they weren't and making money at it. Do you know if any actual Chinese or Japanese or South Asian composers showed up at on Tin Pan Alley or, or mixed nope. race? Is that no, right? Not at all. Um, so not that I have found um, yeah. of any way and it wouldn't really, um, so one of the sources that is actually very interesting for this whole uh, dissertation for me is the, um, in New York, in Chinatown, the Museum of Chinese in America, mm -hmm. which uh, shows 
very many facet uh, as aspects of uh, Chinese history uh, in America and especially in this time frame and um, it that actually for the for the first time that showed me how um, how much Chinese people were really excluded from society and a job such as song songwriter or even publisher on Tin Pan Alley would just simply not have been possible at that time. So uh, Chinese people were in fact so much excluded that the only things they were um, allowed to do were uh, working on certain construction sites um, and most of them were doing were in the laundry business, which is why still today in New York, we see so many uh, laundry businesses still owned by Chinese people because it was just uh, given on throughout the generations. But no, certainly um, working on Tin Pan Alley and especially as some kind of influential publisher would not have been possible um, by a Chinese person at the time. And yet they're weirdly celebrating diversity in a strange way, right? It's it's such a strange, strange, strange. It's such a diverse street and the and the production of it. Yeah, it's. I wonder if you will find someone who was on the. I, I'm I'm curious. I mean, I wonder if it'll surface that there was in fact a composer on that street who was in touch with a Chinese musician, right? Or yeah, I'm curious, but I I. I don't think so, but I mean, maybe. <laughs> and I love your your snippets of of snow. Oh, gosh. oh wow! We have to do a day long Tin Pan Alley. All the music has to be played. We're just going to do twenty four seven, right? Um, question for Madeline. I'm wondering. Well, actually, two questions. One is, so is that in good shape at Museum of City of New York? That's one question. And the other question is, did Alva? I mean, she got divorced and she supported suffrage, right? She was tough. She was ferocious. Did she write about, I, I don't know, remembering holding up that torch and making a statement? Or do we not find that in her, in her, in any of the letters that you, or, or journals that you could dig up? I wasn't able to find anything about her talking about that dress in particular, but I do think that it points to kind of, she was also um, friends with Margaret Stanger. She's like a big, you know, kind of, iconoclast in some ways. So I do think it fits. Um, the dress is in good condition. I, I, as far as I know, it hasn't been on display since I started working on this. So I haven't seen it, but from the images online, I, I think it was worn once and then stored and then donated to the museum. So it's in great shape. So I also know, so I wonder where the torch is. And I know that um, the suffrages passed among themselves a wooden torch. You know, it was passed like an Olympic torch. And I wonder if that, and we're gonna do a whole show on this, right, Madeline? We're gonna gather all the torches of, of these tough late 90, the, the Gilded Age torch as a symbol of women's empowerment. Um, Petra Chu says, is there a connection between the electric um, dress and the sculpture, the spirit of electricity of a nude boy holding up at a torch at the Edison Lab site in West Orange? Right, which I think is run by the National Park Service. Does that sound familiar, or have you I seen mean, it? I I don't know that sculpture. It's possible. Um, I think that Edison's lab and his experiments were widely publicized at the time, so that it would have been possible that I don't I don't know when that statue was installed. So I can't see for sure. Yeah. And right, and all the connections with cycloramas and film too, and the first films, right? The experience of walking around, right? I, I hadn't really realized how 3D that experience was meant to be, that they're literally, they, those, these were life-size, Hannah? I mean, this, the figure on a stretcher or approximate, or sort of very, you know, so stepped back, but meant to appear life-size sort of in the distance. Yeah, usually. I mean, they're very different ones. There, there's one. There's one that's really very well conserved in quite um, in Switzerland of uh, the Bourbaki, um, but um, and it's quite small actually. Uh, so they, they do the earlier ones are quite um, like small is they're still they're but just not 120 meters right. Um, but the definitely the one at Saint Anne de Beaupré. I think the figures are almost human. The diorama figures are almost human size. Uh, because you're on the platform, it doesn't. You don't. You're not actually walking amongst. Usually, the the ground. The ground floor is a bit under under you, so it wouldn't actually. As long as you believe that they're life sized, right, <laughs> is more the idea. 
And Anna George is asking a version of my question, which is, do you see that that sheet music, uh, you know, representing how there was, in fact, you know, that these people were crossing paths, right, in downtown New York? Yeah, I just uh, read the question. I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, as I said, it's difficult to judge these. Um, these 100 year old songs by today's standards and that's indeed not the intention of my um thesis i'm not here to to say all oh, all tin pan alley songs did this or were bad or to put anything in a certain um you know box and leave it there i just think that it is very important to view these things critically and also to um yeah to to think about them in, a, in from many different sides and um, from the yeah the Chinese and the Kun, um, I actually have the the lyrics of of that song. Um, I wrote them down <laughs> because I thought maybe there might be a question about that. Um, and the, the lyrics, just to to make uh, that clear, is this strange amalgamation twixt these two funny nations going to cause an awful jamble soon it will cause great sensation over the whole creation, the wedding of the Chinese and the Kun. Now, yes, it might be a celebration of diversity, but for me, and especially with the depiction of, of, on the cover with the uh, African-American man with the highly exaggerated lips and the kind of like, not not you can't say black facing because it is it is depicting an african american person but um kind of in in that tradition i would say that i mean that's just my personal th um statement but i i don't think that it was celebrating diversity as much as, as it was indeed also showing a kind of yeah, it, it was othering on so many different levels. And I don't think that it's important to ask today, like, was that good or was that bad? It was just, it was that way. And what we do with that today is um, up to different academics <laughs> like us who have to treat it very critically from very many different sides. But I think it's just important to note that um, especially Chinese uh, people, at that time were confronted with xenophobic actions from on a, on a societal level and on a on a level of of the united states towards china and that is just a context that has to be um welcomed into these into these discussions because otherwise it wouldn't be an academic discussion <laughs> And, and yet there's clearly a fast, right, they're being excluded from many aspects, and yet there's clearly this, this deep fascination with them. That yes. A, and, but, a woman, yeah. but a woman has to prove she's not a prostitute and prove she's not an opium dealer in order to get into the States. But right. vamp until you get a cramp. Uh, I just, it, you know, it's, it's, it's catchy <laughs> in some really bizarre way, right? Vamp. Of course. And, and, it's, and I think when dealing with, with cultural phenomena, you always have to know that, yes, it, it was, it, um, it, is, it is in a tradition of, of, a, of, of popular culture. And it was made, I mean, these were mass productions. There were thousands of songs coming out every year, even every month. I mean, this was, the, the rotation of these songs was so quick that nowadays we have to dig through all of these archives and everything to find these songs. And I also have to say that the Great American Songbook that did come out of Tin Pan Alley, these songs that are presented today, they're not part of that. We don't hear the Chinese and the Coon played. No, we don't. We hear, we hear uh, Daisy Bell or, or, or things like that. Like, songs that make us think oh the the good old victorian times but when we hear chong he come from hong kong we don't think back to the great times that um chinese people had in these times we think back of the racism that they um that they experienced so and and, and i'm not going to belabor this but i will introduce you to um frank wu who's the head of queen's college now he collects anti anti-asian propaganda 
on a huge scale. He's done a ton of research. He get he buys ephemera, all fascinating, eerie, powerful, memorable yeah. on eBay all the time. I'll, I'll connect you. Um, Great. Michelle Meyer asked Madeline a question, but she sent it privately to me. Um, when did the costume go to the Museum of City of New York? Are there other costumes from the ball in that collection? And um, oh, she also asked about the Mora photographs. Did the guests receive those photos of themselves or was it um, an album for the Vanderbilts? Were they shown in the press? Um, were they part of the, the, uh, the Vanderbilt's agenda to underscore their New York status? That's a lot of questions, sorry. That's all typed to me, so I'll forward it to you. Um, hi, Michelle. I wrote this paper for Michelle's class, so she's testing me. Um, I, what, the first part was, when was the dress donated? I do not know any longer. I, I knew at one point. Um, the second, the, the albums were, everyone was photographed and the albums were given to the guests. Um, I didn't find any examples of them having been published in the time, but that doesn't mean they weren't. Um, wh where else? Okay, where so else? let's see. So the Mora photographs. Yeah, so, right. So the Vanderbilts, I guess so Mora was, was there or they were taken, they were sort of posed photographs. They were right? taken at the ball. Yeah, they were in costume as they came in. Mora was there taking photos. Um, and yeah, I mean, from what I've read, the Mora photos, basically it was like a, set in in the um room and it was very prestigious to get an album from the ball like everybody wanted one um obviously to prove that you were there and if you look the pictures are very fabulous you can find a lot of them online um everybody looks wonderful and oh in are there any co other costumes from the ball in the collection um not that i'm aware of I haven't been able to find any other costumes that were like specifically worn to that. And it, and it, they're they're cousins. It's a, it's a cousin of the of the fiber of the glass ones that were right. So the World's Fair, the World's Fair in eighteen ninety three. Um, there was a there was a, a dress made out of glass, mm. um, and it's there. A couple of them survived. Corning has one, and there's one in a German museum that was worn by. The, the Infanta Eulalia, and it's beastly heavy, and it's incredibly uncomfortable. And literally, if she sat down, she would have, I mean, she, you, it could, you could not have sat down in it. And again, it was worn once. And there's a scholar in, there's a scholar in uh, Germany who's done conservation work on this thing, because it was, if, if it's not hung properly. I imagine the electric dress is also beastly heavy, right? Um, I mean, it's very heavily beaded, yeah. So I would imagine it was. Yeah, the glass dress, you literally couldn't sit down in it. But it's, but Hannah, it's the same search for spectacle, right? How far can we go within our technological limitations? How many of the cycloramas have you been to? Um, not that many. I've been to the Gettysburg one and to the one in um, Switzerland. And then, yeah, um, no, I haven't been to too many. I've seen a, a lot online. <laughs> Um, and then there's just not that many left, right? So uh, uh, I, I saw a few uh, on my list, but uh, in Germany, there are a few, there are a few pilgrimage ones, uh, smaller ones, but um, a lot, a lot is in, aren't even photographed or anything. So it, it relies a lot on sketches or even just, just keys, right? I had one included in the, mm -hmm. um, so, so it's hard to, to get really a sense of, uh, of, of scale that way. Right, and they're cousins of the panorama one, you know, the um, the ones that were on rollers, right? Well, these would have initially been able to roll up and just fold up and, and travel. The thing is with aging is that uh, the paint doesn't roll up anymore. So they get quite a lot of damage. Uh, yeah. That's the problem of, and the, but there's there's a lot of debate on that. I think the, the, the one in Brooklyn, we have quite a bit of documentation about it arriving on boat uh, from from Belgium, but the one in Quebec is un it was in Montreal and it's unclear if it was rolled up or if so some people have wondered if it was transported as a circular, which seems quite unlikely. But there are traces of a rail track approaching the so a train possibly made special for uh, from the boat to the the dock to the yeah. It's wild because there there are some panoramas that are on rollers that have been conserved or been conserved, you know, for one last time, 
and then really high res photographed and then put away, you know, rolled up. And, you know, so there's a replica, I think, it, I think New Bedford, uh, the, the whaling museum there has a replica if I'm rem remembering correctly. Um, mm -hmm. There are a few being built. Uh, the Pergamon Museum in Berlin just made a uh, a cyclorama that's uh, that I'm that looks quite impressive, and it's a great idea for. It does solve a problem that still exists in, in at least uh, archaeological sites, right? Of not being able to rebuild. So they have it next to the Pergamon altar that they have, and they have this cyclorama of Pergamon in the year 129 AD. So that's a that's one I guess modern I guess um, film hasn't completely phased out, but oh. and and I'm also fascinated that the so this this deeply gridded city of ours that they broke up the grid to put these these cylindrical buildings in right and it doesn't yeah, yeah. it doesn't happen well Castle Gardens is round I'm sure there's people on this call who know more more round buildings in New York but it doesn't happen really dramatically again until you get the Guggenheim Museum right. No, and it's fun looking through those maps and seeing and sort of just you see it right and there's clicking and then getting to the getting to the year where oh it's no longer you can you it's very evident when you can see it and can't see it so that's that's quite fun and there's no there's usually no I actually had to I had a vague idea of where it was in uh, Manhattan the Brooklyn one's clearly documented the one in Manhattan I had a vague idea but I kept on, I, was, I was like oh I spent too many hours on these maps if I just like pass through it and don't no notice the cylindrical structure I'll be quite disappointed oh right so fortunately Manhattan gets mapped and mapped and mapped and mapped at every turn exactly right? yeah. them. it's yeah. insurance maps so they've got all, every every right. incentive to do so right. Yeah. Oh no. Someday we'll get a great little time lapse video of that of the cylindrical buildings coming in, and then the cylindrical buildings vanished. Right. Yeah, it'd be quite funny. Yeah. And Anna, we need to spend a whole day on this material, right? And we need to get scholars of every imaginable background and every angle. We need to get performers in on this, and people interpreting this stuff through modern lenses. And this is is so so much to unpack. What what's your so this is your PhD topic, and it'll be done. You're thinking it's a yearish from now that you're handing something in, or um, it's my master's thesis still. So, yeah, um, I'll be finished. Yeah, hopefully by the end of the year. So I have a, a scholarship that will allow me to research over the summer here in New York City in the um, Library of Performing Arts, where they have a lot of the old sheet music just to to look through. <laughs> and then I hope that I'll I'll finish writing the whole thing by. December or January. Because I, so my, I'm writing a biography of Zoe Anderson Norris, who was a 19th, early 20th century journalist. And she knew suffrage, she's connected to all three of your talks, right? She was born in Kentucky. Um, she, she had very mixed feelings about the Civil War because she had relatives fighting on both sides. Kentucky was a divided state. She uh, was, had mixed feelings about the suffragists for that matter. She thought that people like Alva Vanderbilt were, um, Oh, she thought they were idiots because they weren't actually on the ground, seeing the kind of desperate immigrant poverty that she was documenting when she lived in New York. And she knew a black ragtime composer named Harry Huggs, who wrote Tin Pan Alley songs, um, some of which have the word coon in the title. And uh, there, I know he was educated. I know he was a serious composer, but he wrote in the lyrics are all in black dialect. So it's such, it's so complicated and what people were doing for money. And he has descendants around that I'm trying to reach out to one of them's the musician composer, right? So yes, we'll, all, we'll get a huge panel going. Um, oh wait, so Lynn Funk asks, um, the Manhattan cyclorama, that was what? That was fourth slash Madison and, and 19th, right, Hannah? The one in Manhattan. I think that was 19th Street, right? Yeah, I posted it. I think I posted it in the chat. Yeah. Oh, you did. I see. Okay. I didn't see that. Yeah. 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 Um, does anyone else have any other questions? Because I could go on all night. I'm so I my all my my synapses are on fire. Um, and and the overlaps, right? Who are we as Americans? And and how do we entertain ourselves? And how do we make a statement and how we look and what we dance to? And oh my gosh, I'm, my synapses are on fire. Um, any other questions from the chat? No, I think we're good. So I'm gonna let people go. This was rivetingly fascinating. Thank you so much, all three of you. Congratulations, uh, free Victorian Society memberships to, to all of you and our undying gratitude. And uh, I can't wait to hear what you guys accomplish 
next. I'm really looking forward to publications on your work and exhibitions based on your work and keep me posted. Keep all of us posted. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Thank you 